technology is a wonderful thing until it stops working. So suffice it to say the sound card, microphone, whatever, and my computer is no longer functional. So we're going to have to revert to the old fashioned methods. So I will not have any slides today or to narrate over. So we're just going to revert back to the blackboard. All right, so last time we talked about the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. And we were talking about the structure of the preganglionic neurons and their ganglionic targets versus what was going on at the postganglionic neurons on their targets, which were the effectors. So it's probably a lot easier if we sort of do a quick recap. And this is in your book. There are several, several tables in your book, table 16.1, 16.2 are good tables in your book to look at. But let's look at the sympathetic division. And what I'm going to do is just do an overview because we've seen it before, sympathetic versus parasympathetic. And we know, obviously, this is the fight or flight. This is the rest and digest. We see that we're going to have short preganglionic neurons that are arising from T1 through L2 in those lateral gray horns of the spinal cord. And they are going to usually synapse in one of those vertebral chain ganglia, or they might synapse in a collateral ganglia. But the whatever the postganglionic neuron is, it's usually going to be fairly long. Whereas in the parasympathetic division, we're going to have the preganglionic neurons arising from the brainstem nuclei associated with cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10, as well as our sacral divisions 2 through 4. So our sacral segments of the spinal cord. Hence the name differences are thoracolumbar versus our craniosacral nervous system. So one of the other things that we will notice is that our preganglionic fibers are usually quite long. And they will synapse on targets uh, far distance away. In fact, these targets, we call them either uh, intramural because they're actually embedded in the walls of the organ that they're stimulating, or they're going to be very close to it. So these are going to be very short fibers typically. We saw that these are some of the major differences. The degree of divergence is also quite different, as we saw. So our preganglionic fiber to our ganglionic neurons, we're usually going to have collaterals to up to 32 neurons that our preganglionic neuron will innervate. Whereas over here, it's about six. So our preganglionic neuron will innervate, and I guess I should put this number over here, really, up to six ganglionic neurons. Whereas here, our preganglionic neuron can diverge all over the place, have collaterals going all over the place, and innervate up to about 32. Now, where we stopped was when we looked at the neurotransmitter differences. So one of the things we talked about is the fact that we use acetylcholine as one of our neurotransmitters. And acetylcholine is going to be released by both divisions of the autonomic nervous system at the ganglion. So basically the preganglionic neuron synapsing on the ganglionic neuron will always release acetylcholine, always, in both divisions. So acetylcholine. And what's more, it always is going to release it onto receptors here on the postganglionic neuron, or the ganglionic neuron, I should say, always going to be ligand-gated channels. So it's going to open up a channel. So it's a very direct way of communication. And this channel can also be opened up by the common substance we find in cigarettes, nicotine. Hence, we call these nicotinic. And these are the same receptors that we find in skeletal muscle. So our cholinergic nicotinic receptors are here in both divisions of the autonomic nervous system. But from here is where things get different. When we look at the 
neurotransmitter released by the postganglionic fiber, i.e. the axon that's emerging from the ganglion, will see that they're different in the different divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So for example, in the sympathetic division, we're going to see norepinephrine, which is also known as noradrenaline. Sometimes, very occasionally, we'll see acetylcholine be released and sometimes nitric oxide. When we are going to have our targets, that is our effectors, the effectors, receptors, will be G protein mediated, or at least second messenger systems. So in the case of norepinephrine and acetylcholine, we are going to be activating G protein coupled receptors. So this is no longer a direct communication. We're not just opening channels. We're starting a cascade of events within the target cell. So our G protein mediated receptors are here. And nitric oxide, as you remember, is its own first messenger. It doesn't have to go through a G protein simply because it can diffuse directly through the membrane because it's lipid soluble. And it acts on enzymes within the cell that will then create second messengers. So nitric oxide is also a, going to be the first messenger in our second messenger systems, but all of these are second messengers. Now we're going to look at the adrenergic synapses over here. And we'll find that there are really two major flavors of these adrenergic receptors. We have alpha and we have beta. And they're quite complex, and we're only going to touch on a few things in this chapter. So alpha receptors come in two subdivisions, alpha-1 and alpha-2. Alpha-1, typically the receptors when they receive the neurotransmitter, Alpha-1 will typically uprate, regulate metabolic activity. Alpha-2 will typically downregulate metabolic activity and just activity of the cell. And one of the things we will see is we actually see some alpha-2 receptors on some of our parasympathetic division because what's going to happen is the sympathetic division is going to shut down the parasympathetic division. When it's not time to rest and digest, when it's time to activate the system and sound the general alarm, we'll see that this is one way that the sympathetic division can exercise control over the parasympathetic division. So basically this has an excitatory effect, our alpha-1, where our alpha-2 often has an inhibitory effect on the target cells. Now, if we look at our beta, we've got beta-1, 2, and 3. And just briefly, there's a table in your book for this. I believe it's table 16.2. You can look and see the more details on these neurotrans, uh, these uh, receptor types. But what we will see is our beta-1 typically have an excitatory effect on the cell, typically. So I'll put excitatory. Beta-2 are going to be very specific. So these are going to open up smooth muscles or dilate smooth muscles in the respiratory tract. This is going to be very important. This is exactly what asthma inhalers work on. This is going to try to stimulate beta-2 receptors because this will cause dilation of blood vessels, or I'm sorry, not blood vessels, but uh, bronchi, bronchioles, within the respiratory tract. So dilation of respiratory tract. Respiratory tract. All right, and B3, that's going to cause release of adipose. So it's going to cause the release of our triglycerides so that we can use them for energy, for energy, and these are going to be released from adipocytes. So that's basically what these receptors in a nutshell are going to do. And we will also see some cholinergic neurons, uh, or I should say cholinergic receptors on our targets. So these cholinergic receptors, these are what we are going to call muscarinic. And the reason they're called muscarinic is because they will respond to a mushroom to toxin called muscarine. And in this case, muscarine will emulate the effects of the acetylcholine. And these are not ligand gated. Once again, I mean, they're not uh, direct ligand gated channels. These are basically G protein coupled so that we have a ligand bind with our membrane receptor, which then is going to activate a G protein, which will then activate enzymes within the cell. So this is a muscarinic receptor when we see it postsynaptically on our targets of our muscarinic 
targets of our sympathetic division here. And these will be things like blood vessels. We'll see blood vessels, skeletal muscle, erector pili, I think, of the hair cells will stand up. We'll see sweat gland activation with the cholinergic muscarinic receptors here. And we also see nitri nitric oxide will dilate blood vessels as well in the brain and the skeletal muscles. And this is important because what we're trying to do is bring more blood flow to these organs. And it's going to be important when we're gearing up for a fight or flight response, we have to be mentally alert and our skeletal muscles have to be ready to respond to our commands in order to activate them. All right, so now let's move over to the parasympathetic division. As we've seen, the parasympathetic division like the sympathetic division, and its synapses between our preganglionic neurons and our ganglionic neurons is going to be acetylcholine, once again. And these are going to be nicotinic, so direct channels that are opened by the binding of the ligand to the channel. Now, postsynaptically, we're going to have mostly acetylcholine. So I should say entirely acetylcholine, really. We're going to have acetylcholine, and once again, it's going to be our muscarinic muscarinic receptors over here. So the acetylcholine is going to, when we have it postsynaptically here, our acetylcholine is going to bind to G protein coupled receptors in the membrane of our effectors. So these two will be things like glands and smooth muscles. Remember the parasympathetic division is involved in rest and digest. So we're going to cause salivary gland secretions and we're going to cause digestive gl gland secretions. And we're going to, now we're going to dilate blood vessels within the digestive tract. So now blood vessel, or I should say blood flow, will shift from the skeletal muscles over to the digestive tract. And remember that one of the things that's very interesting about the parasympathetic division is that these, this innervation is very focal. It's going to be on specific target organs to do specific things. And so that's why we don't have the degree of divergence that we do over here. Plus the effects are not going to be as long lasting. One of the things that's interesting is we have in addition in our sympathetic division, remember we also have our adrenal medulla, which is acting as a hormone uh, control center, I should say an endocrine organ, because what's going to happen is the norepinephrine and epinephrine that are released from there are going to act as hormones. And they're going to be put into circulation where they can then bind with receptors and targets all over the body. So this is going to be a much longer lasting re uh, reaction than if we just simply had neurotransmitter binding to a receptor on a postsynaptic cell. So we can actually sort of gear up the body to respond to a threat by having the dynamics of how these neurotransmitters work and how these uh, stimulation work. So it's going to be a longer lasting effect. Whereas over here, we're just controlling things that are going to be involved with very specific processes. So for example, we've already talked about some of the things the parasympathetic nervous system does besides just increasing the digestive tract activity, also constricts the pupils, which is going to let, let, let in less light. That allows us to pay attention to things that are close to us so that we can now put our focus on things that are near to us, things that are going to be more intimate, more close to what, where we are and what we're doing, instead of putting our focus out there in the environment where we're looking for threats, we're looking for predators, we might be hyper alert to sounds and sights. Whereas when the parasympathetic division kicks in, we're sort of putting all that out in the periphery and focusing in on what's close. So another thing that we will see about the parasympathetic division is also called the anabolic division. Because what it does is now, now that we have time to relax, all the in the materials that we're able to ingest during when we eat, whatever, we're going to ingest food, uh, macromolecules that will then be broken down. Now we can shift the focus to breaking down our macromolecules and digestion into their component parts that can now be built up into structures and into energy stores. So for example, 
When we have sympathetic stimulation, we have release of all our energy stores. Over here, we have the release of triglycerides from the adipose tissue. We're going to have release of glycogen from the liver. We're going to have breakdown of glycogen into glucose. Over here, we're going to have exactly the opposite. We're going to have an anabolic effect. We're going to be storing triglycerides rather than breaking them down. We're going to be taking our sugar glucose monomers and building them into chains of glycogen to be used later on. We're also going to be taking the nutrients from digestion and building protein structures from them and other structures all around the body. So we're going to be taking amino acids. We're going to increase the uptake of these raw materials by cells all around the body. We're going to have hormone uh, secretion that's going to cause some uptake of these these nutrients, and then they'll be used to build structures and be used to build the body rather than to tear stuff down. Let's watch what we have over here. So this is another reason we have different names for these divisions. So sympathetic is not just called sympathetic. We know it's the uh, thoracolumbar division. It's also called the catabolic division. Over here, our parasympathetic division is also called our craniosacral division and is also going to be called our anabolic division. Now, we talked earlier about the arrangement of the sympathetic division in quite a bit of detail. In the parasympathetic division, we have our cranial nerves. We're gonna have some of our parasympathetic stimulation leave through these cranial nerve nuclei that are associated with these cranial nerves. And that's going to be stimulating our ganglionic neurons for our parasympathetic division. We also have uh, the spinal segments S2 through S4 will also be where some of these nuclei for the parasympathetic division arise, and they will be sending their outputs through what we call pelvic nerves. So you recall over here in the sympathetic division, we had our splanchnic nerves and these were coming into our collateral ganglia, and most of them were preganglionic fibers coming into our co collateral ganglia. Well, over here, and we also had a lumbar that were mostly postganglionic fibers, but over here, we've got our pelvic nerves, and these are going to be arising from S2 through S4, and these are going to be preganglionic fibers that are going to go out to their target organs. All right, so now let's talk about dual innervation. So we've got parts of the body that are going to be receiving information from both of these systems at once. And they're going to have to, for example, the heart, they're going to have to have sort of this interplay between these two systems that are regulating the functions of these organs. So as we know, the sympathetic division increases your heart rate and the force of contraction, the parasympathetic division is going to decrease it. But we're going to get fibers from both systems intermingling into these plexi or plexuses. And these plexuses are where we have an intermingling of fibers from the sympathetic and parasympathetic division. So a lot of times we're gonna see some, some postganglionic fibers from the sympathetic division that are intermingling with the preganglionic fibers from the sympathetic division. Oftentimes that's what we see. And so they will have to intermingle in these nerve, interwoven meshwork of nerves around that target organ. So we have like a cardiac plexus and so forth. So it's very important to realize that dual innervation happens with a lot of our organ systems and it usually has opposing effects as we've talked about earlier. Now, one of the things that's interesting to note, especially when it comes to cardiac respiratory and, and digestive function, that over 75%, 75%, of parasympathetic outflow occurs over cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve. So vagus nerve is going to account for about 75% of our parasympathetic outflow. So this is quite important. Now there are some cases that we will see, for example, during sexual arousal, where you have an interplay between the two systems. So that when you're in the rest and digest mode, this is when people can start, or animals or whatever, can start thinking about things other than, you know, living or dying. So this is when they turn their attention to those kinds of things. So the arousal portion of sexual arousal is going to happen under parasympathetic stimulation. But later, some of the things that happen later within that, that process are going to be under sympathetic stimulation. So a lot of times there's kind of a handoff effect. So the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system are working together, but not in opposition. 
they're working in, in doing different things. Then we have a third type of innervation and that's basically called autonomic tone that we've talked about where only one division of the autonomic nervous system is going to control the organ system but it does so by having a baseline firing so if we look at for example smooth muscles around the blood vessels so the vascular system that is going to be regulated entirely by the sympathetic division and so basically we're going to increase the tone or decrease it depending on whether we want to increase the peripheral blood vessel, per, uh, sorry, per peripheral blood pressure by constricting those luminal diameters of our blood pressure or blood vessels. If we constrict the luminal diameters, that's going to increase blood pressure. If we open up the luminal diameter of those blood vessels, that's going to decrease blood pressure. And in certain target areas, it's going to increase blood flow. So, a lot of times what we're going to see is that the, the sympathetic division, in this case, is going to have complete control over these particular structures. And we have a baseline firing so that typically if we look at luminal diameters of blood vessels, you know, they're at a particular set point. And we have a baseline firing that's going to be continuous. And then when we need, say, to to increase blood pressure, then we'll increase our autonomic tone and those luminal diameters will constrict. And when we need to decrease blood pressure or open up our luminal diameters, then we're going to have a decrease in firing in the sympathetic division. And this is just simply an example of autonomic tone. So those are the three ways that we can see how the autonomic nervous system exerts its influence over other, uh, other organ systems. So. That's one of the things that we pretty much have uh, talked about before, but it's worth reiterating here. And there are several nice diagrams in your book that compare and contrast the differences between the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system. So I think that will conclude our, our comparison of the two. And now that will allow us to talk about some of these higher order functions as well as certain reflexes. And that's why I started with the uh, piano playing in the beginning, because that is an example of a higher order function. And also to demonstrate the fact that my computer over here just went kaput on me, so. Now let's look at some autonomic reflexes. And just as we had reflexes that controlled skeletal muscles to prevent to do things like prevent us from falling or leaving our hand on a hot stove or something like this, we also have visceral reflexes that are going to control the function of visceral effectors. So things like, for example, the pupils in our eyes. Our visceral reflexes are constantly going to be adjusting the size of the pupil to match how much light's coming in so that when we're in a low light environment, the pupils will get bigger to allow more light in. As we go into a very bright light environment, the pupils will constrict, and this will prevent damage to that very delicate retinal surface of the eye in the back of the eye that is going to be the sensory neurons that are going and receptors that are going to transduce light into neural signals. So this is a very delicate apparatus, and we have to protect it. Well, we've got visceral reflexes that are, operate very similarly to somatic reflexes, except that they work on visceral re receptors. So they're gonna work in a very similar way. We're gonna have a receptor out here. We've got our peripheral receptor. We have our sensory afferent, and in this case, we've got what we call a long reflex, which is very similar to the polysynaptic reflexes we saw in the somatic reflexes. But we're going to have this afferent that's going to come in here. It's going to synapse on a, an interneuron somewhere within either the spinal cord or a brainstem region. And then that interneuron will synapse on a motor efferent. And in this case, it's going to be our preganglionic fiber, which is then going to exit, in this case, the spinal cord via the ventral root. And here it's going to travel to a ganglion where it will synapse on a postganglionic neuron that will then innervate a target organ. Now, we do have some things called short reflexes. And short reflexes bypass the central nervous system altogether. And we see this particularly in things like digestion. Now, digestion is interesting in that, remember, it has its own enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system can pretty much run itself. 
And the enteric nervous system has its own set of reflexes that completely can bypass the central nervous system. And we can see some other visceral reflexes that work like this that don't really need the central nervous system the way our somatic reflexes do. Another thing to notice about this is most of our visceral reflexes are going to be parasympathetic. And the reason for that is the parasympathetic division is going to exert the most control over specific targeted regions. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system is just sounding the general alarm is going to activate all of our organ systems typically or our body systems in such a way to handle a threat. So this is why most of the the reflexes that we see that are autonomic are going to be associated with the parasympathetic division. Once again, we can have a long reflex, which is mediated through the central nervous system, or a short reflex, which can bypass the central nervous system altogether. Nevertheless, we still have a receptor, an afferent, but in this case, the afferent is going to go directly into an autonomic ganglion. And it's going to synapse on an interneuron in the autonomic ganglion, which will then synapse on the postganglionic or the ganglionic neuron that since it's postganglionic axon out to the target. So now I'm going to try a little bit of a kludge. I'm going to use the internal microphone that's built into the computer. And while the sound quality may not be that great, I figure it can't be any worse than what's on my phone. So let's take a quick look at this diagram. This picks up where we left off. And this is going to summarize the differences and the similarities between the autonomic, sorry, the autonomic reflexes on this side and the somatic reflexes on this side. All of our somatic reflexes will be mediated through the central nervous system. Whereas some of the autonomic nervous systems will be, those are our long reflexes, others will bypass the central nervous system altogether and will be mediated entirely within those autonomic ganglia. So our long reflexes are going to, going to be mediated through the central nervous system. Our short reflexes will be mediated entirely within the autonomic ganglia. Another thing the diagram shows is the highly interconnectedness that we have, or the high degree of interconnectedness we have with some of these autonomic centers. Remember, that the seat of the autonomic center is in the hypothalamus and other brain structures. So we're going to have quite a bit of top-down, that is, higher-order thinking, influence our reflexes. So a lot of what we will see in our reflexes, they can be attenuated, depressed, or in, enhanced depending on our emotional states and states of arousal and so forth. Now let's talk about some higher-order functions. And these are things that are going to require the cerebral cortex. These are things that are going to involve conscious processing. So higher order functions are going therefore to require the involvement of the cerebral cortex and they will also involve processing both conscious and unconscious information. These are also not part of our innate wiring. These are things that we are going to gain with experience and learning. So we've got at the center of it we've got memory and we've got two types of memory. We've got fact memories which can include episodic memories of things that happened in our lifetime. So what we did when we were five years old, what our favorite song was when we were 10, who our first you know, hero was, these kinds of things. And they can also contain specific bits of information like dates and facts, like 1066 was the time that William the Conqueror came from France and conquered England. Okay, so that's a fact memory that a lot of people will learn in their history class and these kinds of things. And things like what you're studying in anatomy and physiology, these are all fact memories. We also have skill memories, which are learned motor behaviors, such as unscrewing a bottle cap, tying your shoes, these kinds of things. And these are small skill memories that are stored in various areas of the motor cortex, basal nuclei, and cerebellum. But we also can build on these skill memories and build much larger, more complicated programs. An example being playing the piano. So when you start to learn to play the piano, you learn how to put your fingers on the keys, you learn scales, you learn chords, you learn arpeggios, you learn these kinds of things. And then you can build those memories, those skill memories into larger programs, into things like playing a piece of music. We also have, when we think about our fact memories, we can divide those into short-term memories and long-term memories. So our short-term memory is stuff that we recall immediately. This is like when we look up a phone number to dial it, but we 
don't really need to call that place again. So we only remember the number as long as it takes for us to dial it. And by the time the telephone conversation is over, then we just forget it. And these are what are called primary memories. If we don't need that information, we can discard it. If we do need that information, let's say it's a number we realize we're going to be using a bit in the future. So then we'll remember it. We'll commit it to memory. And then it'll become a secondary memory. So this is a long-term memory. And long-term memories are basically short-term memory that we have now consolidated in such a way that they will last longer than a few seconds to a few minutes. So literally the, the term that we use, memory consolidation, is the conversion of short-term short memory into long-term memory. And as I said, we've got secondary memories. And these are memories that usually will fade fairly quickly if you don't keep doing things to remember them. And they may require some effort to recall. So a secondary memory would be something like if you're studying for your anatomy and physiology exam and you remember everything and you take the exam, two weeks later, you're going to remember some of it. Two months later, you'd probably have to go back and study it again. Two years later, if someone asked you about some of these structures, you'd be like, huh? So you would have, these are memories that will fade with time and they're going to require some effort to recall and this is the kind of thing that if you want to keep these memories you got to keep sort of refreshing them every every so often and then we have our tertiary memories these are the memories that are with you all your life like what's your mother's name probably what your first phone number was these are things that you will probably remember all of your life now this happens through a several processes but basically what's going to happen is you got to have repetition so short-term memory usually is going to take some repetition in order for us to consolidate it into long-term memory usually about an hour depending on how complicated the bit of information it is that we're trying to remember and then that secondary memory may stay with us for a while if it's something that we're not going to need six months from now we're probably not going to invest the energy in keeping it around in storage in memory storage tertiary memories however are things that we will use all of our lives and facts and bits of knowledge that we'll use all of our lives. So secondary memories can, you can have a temporary loss and then you can refresh them, so to speak, go back and review. Let's say you're studying for your board exams two years from now and you don't remember everything that you studied in anatomy and physiology, but you can go back and you can refresh it. Doesn't take as long to, to learn it the second time and then you can regain that, that memory. But once you've learned it, to the point where you're not going to forget it, then it is a tertiary memory. If you let it go and you don't refresh it, then you can lose it completely and you'd have to relearn it again somewhere down the line. All right, so we've got several systems within the brain that are important in memory. And we've already seen the limbic system is very important. We've seen that the hippocampus is absolutely essential for memory consolidation, short-term memory into long-term memory. Without the hippocampus, we can't consolidate short-term memory into long-term memory. The mammillary bodies are also important in this process. The uh, hypothalamus, we've got another area that is going to be important. And this, the amygdala is going to be very important in this memory consolidation process. We will also see that there is a structure that is a deep brain structure called the nucleus basalis. And I will give it its full name, the nucleus basalis of Maynard, simply because I don't want you to confuse it with the basal nuclei. It sounds similar, but it's different. And this is a cholinergic brain area that has lots of inputs from the limbic system and through the thalamus and through the cerebral cortex. So this is going to modulate things like attentional states, states of arousal. This is going to modulate all of that. And also, some research has recently implicated it in switching from sort of an internal representation to paying attention to the external representation or the real world. So switching back and forth between memories of things and actual things and sort of a comparison system between the two. So the nucleus basalis can help us switch from internal processing to external processing as well. And obviously the cerebral cortex. As we will see, memory consolidation and long-term memory is a distributed process and what that means is bits of memories will be bits of each memory will be stored all over the brain so for example when we think about certain things we are going to 
remember what it smells like, what it feels like if we touch it, what it looks like, what it what it might sound like if it makes noises. So each time we have, so say for example, your car, you remember what your car looks like. You probably remember how it sounds, what the materials are in your, your seat, what it feels like to touch those materials, what it feels like to touch the gear shift lever and the, the steering wheel and all of these kinds of things. And each bit of the whole memory that is your car is going to be stored in separate areas of the brain that are specialized for that type of sensory processing. And then our sensory integration areas will put all of this information together. So there are people, interestingly, who have had strokes that they will lose part of memories of a particular thing. So there are people who will lose neurons that are important for face recognition. And they will lose the ability to identify even their, their significant others, their spouses, their mothers, or their fathers. And they could be in a crowd and they'd see a bunch of faces and they couldn't be able to recognize who was who. But they could recognize their voices. So when the person spoke, they would recognize them by their voice. So memories, this sort of just demonstrates how memories can be a distributed, uh, distributed throughout the brain. So the cerebral cortex is very important in that different aspects of memory of an object or a memory of an object or an event can be contained within different areas of the cerebral cortex. The limbic system, as we know, is important to memory consolidation. And this is why damage to the limbic system can cause dysfunction. And we see damage to the limbic system, especially the hippocampus and diseases like Alzheimer's. Also, Alzheimer's affects the nucleus basalis of Maynard as well. And so it becomes more difficult to consolidate long-term memories if the hippocampus is damaged. In the case where it's completely damaged or gone, then that task becomes impossible. So the limbic system is quite important, but it also gives a valence to a particular situation. So things with a high emotional valence will remember much, much more easily. So if we have a very unpleasant or a very pleasant situation, we're much more likely to remember it than if it were just a day-to-day -day thing that happened. All right, the nucleus basalis, as we've said, this is a cerebral nucleus. It's near the diencephalon. It's actually slightly anterior to it. And it's sort of inferior and slightly anterior to the amygdala. But we know that it has some role in memory storage and re retrieval. And it's also going to contract, connect, as we say, um, be connected with the limbic system and the cerebral cortex. So damage to this area can change emotional states, memory and intellectual functions. This area is often damaged in people who have Alzheimer's disease and those people will have very unstable emotional states. They'll, they'll become paranoid and have um, all kinds of problems due to damage within these areas, within both the hippocampus, the limbic system, and the nucleus basalis. All right, so the cerebral cortex, as we've said, is where we store our long-term memories. Now, going back to the example that I made of playing the piano at the beginning of the lecture, that is all going to be stored as long-term memories, and the, that particular piece of music will be stored not only as an auditory percept in auditory association areas, but when I think about playing that piece of music, the, there's a pre-motor area that has the program that allows me to execute that piece of music. And also I might have some emotional state. How does that piece of music make me feel? What was I doing at the time when I first learned that piece of music? And you know, what sorts of things were going on in my life? And that might actually, those memories might also be correlated and tied to it. So the cerebral cortex, memory is really a distributed thing in the cerebral cortex. We don't just have one little area that's dedicated to one little memory. And as we've said before, we've got neurons all over the brain that are going to be processing different aspects of memories. And in some case, we have neurons that are sensitive to faces. So these sometimes were called grandmother cells because they would literally recognize your grandmother. And sometimes damage to these things would mean that you would lose some aspect of that memory. You might lose the aspect of being able to recognize your grandmother by sight, but you would remember her voice, or you might remember the way she walked, or you might remember the type of perfume that she wore and the smell of her perfume, or you might remember that her favorite thing to cook was chocolate brownies, and you may associate the smell of chocolate brownies with your grandmother. 
So we have all kinds of cerebral regions, cortical regions, I should say, that are involved in this memory, as we've said, visual association areas, auditory association areas, so that, once again, going back to that piece of music, I've got a very clear memory, auditory percept of what that piece sounds like, visual areas even, what, where my hand should be going on the keyboard when I'm playing it, as well as a haptic sense that will be processed in other areas, so that when I recall that thing, that memory, and then when I go to execute that piece again, then those similar circuits in the brain will be executed. And a lot of this will be orchestrated by the frontal lobes. So our prefrontal cortex is going to be important for planning and for making decisions. So a lot of times the frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex specifically, is going to be involved whenever we are making decisions about what to do based on previous experience, which is all contained in our memories, and our desired outcomes. All right, so as we've said, we've got ways to learn and ways to lay down memories. So we've already talked about some of the structures that are involved, but now let's talk about how they do it. So we've got, for example, neurotransmitter release from one neuron to another, and we can increase the amount of neurotransmitter that's released as we are building memories. So we can, every time, let's say that I want to do a particular thing or remember a particular fact, and there's a neuron within the circuit that's going to help me remember that fact, we can increase the neuron, the neurotransmitter secreted by the, or released by the presynaptic neuron. We can also have facilitation at synapses. This is basically where the presynaptic neuron will continuously release low levels of neurotransmitter, and that's going to raise the membrane resting potential on the postsynaptic cell. It's going to raise it a little bit, so it's going to take less stimulation from other neurons or less stimulation, less neurotransmitter release, in order to bring that neuron to threshold. And finally, we can make more dendritic spines and have more synapses, uh, more synaptic terminals from the axons that will be associated with these dendritic spines. So we can actually increase the physical number of synapses between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron. And we have a sort of a saying in neuroscience that neurons that fire together wire together. So as you stimulate the presynaptic neuron more and more and more, and you're going to get an output from the postsynaptic neuron, the more that you run the circuit, the more likely that these neurons are going to fire. So that when you have presynaptic stimulation, the more likely you're going to get a response from the downstream neuron. And this was first discovered by a researcher named Donald Hebb in the 50s. And so we sometimes call this Hebbian learning. So Hebbian learning is this idea that neurons that fire together wire together. And this whole idea of a circuit that contains a memory is a memory engram. And we talked about the idea that memories are not just a simple neuron or two that are containing information, but they're distributed throughout the cerebral cortex and that memories are basically bits of information that are stored all over the brain relative or relevant to that type of sensation. So the visual aspect of memory versus the auditory aspect of a memory versus the olfactory, they're all stored separately and then recombined. And that whole idea of a circuit that's that is activated every time we, we recall that memory, we call that a memory engram, E-N-G-R-A-M. And this is actually not really a well-defined thing. We haven't really found a true example of a memory engram. This is a theoretical construct. And it is true, if, if you look at neurons that are being recorded as animals are doing particular tasks that require a very specific output, they will be variation over, over time in the output of those neurons. So basically a memory engram is not just a specific circuit, but it is a group of areas that become activated together. So that when we look at the remembrance of, say, a specific episode in your life, when you went to the beach maybe, you remember what the, it smells like, the salt water, maybe the creosote in the boardwalks, maybe you remember the temperature and what it felt like. You remember the sounds of the ocean waves. You remember the 
sights of the water and the sand and seagulls and all of these things. And you're basically putting together a picture that are coming from multiple areas of the brain where these little individual bits of information are stored.